back. All right, if you would please stand and turn in your hymnals to 205. He keeps me singing. <laughs> How ironic is that, right? He keeps Dave singing. 205, we'll do the first three. When the ghost of Tiffany appears over our sound system. <laughs> Todd. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, got a uh, little thank you note. It says, uh, Dear Lighthouse friends, thank you so much for the flowers and precious card. We love you all sincerely in Christ, Roger and Jenny Hope. So uh, they sent that today and got it in the mail. And I texted him and been checking in on him, and he said he's slowly getting better. He says he's excited. He got up and fixed his breakfast, I think, three times now, three mornings. He said he's been able to shave each morning and all that. So he said, slowly getting there. <laughs> so, uh, so just continue to keep him in your prayers. And I think that's about it, really. Uh, as far as announcements, we got Brother Benny. Uh, we'll be back with us next week. And I think that's it. For today. All right, if you would please turn in your hymnals to number two. Glory to his name. And we'll sing it.
please come on up and share the message with us this evening. If you missed out this morning, you really missed out. That's a good message. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, here's your Bible this evening. with the book of 1 Samuel, uh, chapter number 21. 1 Samuel, chapter number 21. Uh, tonight, man, it's been a great day. We have enjoyed being here and getting and enjoyed getting to fellowship with y'all and get to know you a little bit better uh, from when we were here last time. And so, just and just uh, it's just been a good day. And uh, thank you so much for the for the diapers, everybody who who bought a box or a package of diapers. Thank you so much. That was a very uh, a very uh, nice thing of y'all to do. And so, we greatly appreciate that. And uh, Tate will not be uh, lacking for diapers anytime soon, and it's a thanks to y'all. And so I just want to say thank you uh, on behalf of him and on behalf of us uh, this evening. So thank you so much for doing that. And it has just been a great day, y'all's generosity and uh, just, your, just your friendliness as we've been here today. It's been wonderful. And not everywhere that we go is like this, believe it or not. It's, it's not always like this. And uh, but it's just been it's just been a great day. We felt right at home uh, getting to be here with y'all, and so thank you for being friendly and welcoming and taking good care of us. We we really do appreciate that. I'll share a little bit about my ministry before we get into the message tonight. Uh, we do travel in full time evangelism and have for the last several years. And uh, last July, the Lord really put it on our heart uh, to begin moving forward and getting a gospel tent to hold tent meetings, and uh, and so. Uh, that was in July of last year, and so uh, the last Sunday of July, uh, last year, the Lord really confirmed in our heart that's the direction that He wanted us to go. And so we began to pray and say, God, uh, if this is what you want us to do, you're going to provide the funds because you know we don't have them. And so a man that I had talked to who has a gospel tent said, you're going to need about $30,000 just to get started. Tents are not cheap, and everything that, that goes with it, chairs, sound systems, hymnals, uh, um, I mean, the there's just a, a platform, pulpit. I mean, there's just a whole host of things that you need. And so he said, you're going to need about $30,000 just to get started uh, with the gospel tent. And so a trailer to put everything in. And so he said, Lord, you know, we don't have that. We don't have $30,000 laying around extra. We can just go out and buy these things. And so we begin to pray, God, if this is what you want us to do, then you're going to have to supply the money uh, somehow, some way. And so we just begin to pray for that. And, and from the process of, uh, of last July, July of last year to the current, the Lord has provided uh, over $27,000 for us to get started uh, in the tent ministry. And we are beyond thankful for all that he's done. And uh, it has come from various different places. And, uh, but I'm say, thankful that we serve a God in heaven uh, that is capable, that is able. And he strolls on streets of gold. And so I, I know this, that he is faithful. And he, when he calls you to do something, when he asks you to do something, he's going to provide a way for you to do that. And so we just began to pray, God, provide the funds. And so we are, we are so close. And that budget of $30,000 was right on target because we are right at $2,500 short of what we need. Uh, to finish everything up, we still have a few needs that we need to take care of uh, as far as getting things ready. And so that budget that that that, that, that man gave us, who has a ten of thirty thousand, was right on target. And we're with that twenty-seven five, and we still need twenty-five hundred. And so, but I do know this: I know this that God is faithful and God is just. And if He can provide twenty-seven thousand dollars, then He can take care of twenty-five hundred dollars. And so we're just trusting Him to do that. And, uh, and he's just been so good. We're so excited. We pick up our tent this Thursday, uh, Lord willing, unless something changes. And so we go get it this Thursday. And our first tent meeting is the third week of September. And so uh, September the 18th is a Sunday. We kick off our very first meeting. And I am, uh, you can't tell, but on the inside, I am jumping for joy. I am beyond excited. I talk about it a lot. I think about it a lot. It's always on my brain. And I mean, we're just so excited about that. It's excited what the Lord is going to do with that ministry. Uh, you know, you don't hear of tent meetings much anymore, but I believe God can st can still use them and to see folks saved and see folks get into church. And so we're just praying that He would use us and our tent in a great way in the days ahead. And so if you pray with us about that, I pray that the Lord would open doors for us to set the tent up. Pray that the Lord would provide the twenty five hundred that we still need, and uh, and pray that that God would also supply some more monthly support for us as with driving the three-quarter ton uh, diesel there is added an expense there and uh, because we have to be able to pull the tent around so it takes a larger vehicle and uh, there's just there's just several different expenses that they come with uh, having a gospel tent and so if you pray for us Lord provide those needs we would surely greatly appreciate it but uh, it's been so good to get to be here today and thank you for taking good care of us 
being friendly to diapers, it's just been wonderful. We felt right at home. And so I just, just want to thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. First Samuel chapter number 21. First Samuel chapter number 21. It is only about 6, 12 or so. And like this morning, the, the, the more amens I hear, the faster that I preach. And so I probably will be done before 7 o'clock. And so everybody said amen. I heard the other day somebody said, preach short, get support. And so I've taken it to heart, but it hadn't worked so far. So we'll see what happens. And uh, First Samuel chapter number 21. Begin reading in verse number, uh, verse number eight. First Samuel chapter twenty-one, verse number eight says, "And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste." And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind uh, the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is none other save that here. And David said, There is none like that, give it me. Verse number 10 says, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and went to Achish the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad in their hand, and scrabbled on the door of the gate, and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? For chapter 22 Verse number 1 says, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for the day. And God, I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to be here and meet these great folks at this great church. And Lord, I pray that you bless the church in the days ahead. Lord, I pray that you would send the man of God to mount this pulpit every week and uh, that he would be the pastor here. God, I pray that you would send him to this place. And God, that you would unite the hearts of the people with the, with the pastor, and God, that you would just do a great and mighty work here. Lord, I pray that you bless the service tonight, and God, that you would just meet with us in a special way. The Holy Ghost of God would blow in, and God, it would encourage us in a great and mighty way. We'll thank you for your many blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Here in First Samuel chapter 21, I want to preach on this thought for a few minutes. I want to preach on this thought. Everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. Okay, I'm thankful that we can trust God. I'm thankful that He knows what's best. And I'm thankful that He is a God that is in charge of everything that goes on in our life. Here, David, he begins to write. He, begin, or he begins to, to live his life, if you will. And as he's here in our text, you may know, may not know, he is on the run for his life from Saul, the king at this particular particular time. Here David is. He's been on the run for somewhere between five and seven years total before he rightly takes the throne in the book of Second Samuel. But on the thought of everything is going to be okay. Here's David. And I mean, he has just, uh, he, he's just been through a lot. He's just, he, 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 he has had to deal with a lot in his life. And here in chapter 21 is the exact same way. But I want you to notice number one tonight uh, notice number one, uh, that David was a man that was in trouble. David was a man that was in trouble. You look at David's life, and as he started out as, the, as a young man, we pick up in David's life, he's, he, he's a young man, and we pick up his life in chapter 14, chapter 15, somewhere uh, in there, chapter 16, uh, for Samuel, and he's a, he's a young boy, he's out watching his father's sheep, and, and, and he's just, uh, he's doing what his father has asked him, to take care of those sheep out in the, in the field and in the pasture, and, and one day there comes a bear, and the bear tries to steal a lamb, or t- steal a sheep, and he, he smites that, that lion, he smites the bear, he does that on two different occasions, a lion came and a bear came, you would know the story, and, and he, sl- he, he just kills those animals for, for trying to steal the lambs that were, and the sheep that were rightfully his father's, and, and and his life seems to be going very well, and he's out there with his harp, and he's playing his harp, and he, he's singing before the Lord in heaven. And, and he, I mean, can you even imagine, as David is here, being literally 
in the presence of God, him with just these, these sheep, and then there's David, and he's, he's literally singing and playing out in this field in the presence of God. I can only imagine the sweet spirit, the sweet time that he would have had with God out there with those sheep playing and singing to him. But his life seems to be going pretty well. It seems to be going pretty good. There's no major hiccups. I mean, he seems to be pretty happy. And one day, he, one of his brothers comes and and comes out from down from the house and said, Hey, David, Dad needs to see you up at the house. Dad needs you up at the house real quick. And so David begins to head to the house, and he gets there, and he, he realizes there's some commotion going on. He realizes that, uh, that something is taking place, and he quickly realizes that Samuel, the prophet is there at his house and, and he is trying uh, to find the man that would be the next king and anoint him as king. And he had, you know the story, he had went down from the oldest all the way down to the youngest. And they finally, they, and Samuel says to Jesse, do you have any more sons? And she said, yeah, we've got that, the, the last one down there in the field watching those sheep. And so Jesse, David finally gets up to the house and, and he was quickly anointed as the next king. And I can only, only imagine the shock that probably was in his mind as he's just been anointed as the next king. I don't think he's seen this coming. I don't think that he was aware of what was fixing to take place. But he gets to the house and he's anointed the next king of Israel. His life seems to be going pretty well and, and I mean everything looks like it's doing okay. Very quickly after that we know that David was promoted if you will and he had become a Saul's armor bearer. And then what an honor it would be to, to bear the armor of the king at this particular time. But not only that, he would go in and he would begin to play the harp for Saul and, and begin to, to, just, to just bring the presence of God into the, the place where Saul was the king and where he was reigning from and playing that harp. And you know the story. After some time, Saul takes that javelin and he, he throws it and he tries to smite David to the wall. And that happened on two separate occasions. And, and here David's life seemed to be going very well. It seems to be doing very good. He's been anointed as the king. He's been put in place as the armor bearer. But then all of a sudden David's life literally turns upside down to now somebody's taking a javelin and they try to smite him to the wall. This was not a game. No, no, no. This was not something, uh, an accident. Saul was trying to kill David, trying to take his life. We know that happened on two separate occasions. And you know the story, but in chapter number 19 of 1 Samuel, Saul puts out a decree, speaks to the men, and he says this, And Saul spake to Jonathan his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. Saul speaks to his son and to all these men, that if they are to see, if they see David, they're to kill him. If they hear of David's location, they are to go to that location and find him and kill him. Now, I want you to understand that in David's life, Saul was not the only person that was against him. Saul was not the only person that was trying to kill him. No, 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 my friend. As a matter of fact, the entire nation has been given a command, has been given a charge that if anybody sees David, kill him. Can you even imagine can you even imagine as you wake up one morning and you realize that your whole country is against you? And you can't even figure out what you've done wrong. But that's where David is. And his life literally went from everything being fine and everything being dandy. And, and then he's on an upward scale and his life seems to be going good. And he's watching these sheep and he's in the presence of God. And he's anointed as the king. And, and then he's the armor bearer for Saul. And I mean, everything seems to be going so well. So then in a moment's time, his life literally turns upside down. And everybody in the whole country is on his tail trying to kill him. We find that David was a man... That was in trouble. I mean, as he is running for his life, it is a time period of between five and seven years. Five and seven years when he would lay his head potentially on a rock every single night and go to sleep. Not knowing if somebody was going to find him. Not knowing if somebody was going to catch him up with him. Not knowing if this would be the last night of his life before somebody killed him. And it was literally, I'm sure the, the thoughts began to flow through David's mind. Everybody is against me and I don't even know why. Ever felt like that? Ever felt like that everybody was against you? Everybody was, uh, was against you and everything that you had uh, planned and everything that you wanted to do for God? Everybody was against you? I think that's where David was in our text tonight. But not only, not 
I want you to notice that David was a man that was in trouble. I also want you to notice that David was a man that was terrified. David was a man that was terrified. We look at our text here in chapter number 21, and I want you to look at verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. It says, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and went to Achish the king of Ath, for fear of Saul. David was terrified for his life. He was, all, he was a man that was in trouble, but he was also a man that was terrified. Have you ever been scared? I've been scared. I know I have. I've been scared. Maybe uh, somebody has literally jumped out and scared me. That's always a blessing. But uh, I've also been scared in other circumstances in my life. When, it, when I get a phone call and, and there's news on the other end, sometimes I get a little bit nervous or get scared. When, when, it, when, it, when a bill comes in, sometimes I get a little bit nervous and I get a little bit scared. And I'm sure you have been there as well. When the circumstances of life begin to, to beat in against the shores of our life, and we begin to get a little bit nervous and begin to be a little bit terrified for the end result. And here's David, and he willingly admits, for fear of Saul, I'm going to Achish. David was a man that was terrified. In Psalm chapter 56, verse number 3, it says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. But fear will cause people to do things that they normally would never do. Fear will cause people to do things that they would not normally ever do. But because of the, because of the fear that's overtaking them, they, they uh, perform an action that they normally would not. And here David does a couple of things that I don't believe he would never have done if he had not been scared for his life. Number one, I want, or first of all, I want you to notice that but because of fear, David lied. Look at verse number eight. Verse number 8, it says, And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor, nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. He wasn't on the king's business. This was a lie. David lied to Ahimelech, and he said, Look, I'm on the king's business, and it was a, it was a hasty thing. I had, to, I had to run out on king's business, but, and I forgot my sword. I forgot my weapons. But that wasn't true. David was running for his life from the king, and David lied because of the fear that he was in. But not only did David lie, but David also crossed some lines. Verse number 10, we just read it, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Now, there was somebody else from Gath that I think you would recognize. His name was Goliath. Goliath was from Gath. So here's David, and in a moment of courage, in a moment of triumph, in a moment of faith, he kills Goliath the Philistine, which is, was the enemy of God at that time and throughout many pages of Scripture. He kills the Philistine, but now in a moment of fear, in a moment of weakness, while he is terrified, he makes a hasty decision to not defeat the giant, to not defeat the enemy, but instead to run to the enemy and join forces with them. In a moment of fear. And fear will cause people to do things that they normally would not have, ever have done in their life. Just like here in David's life. But I want you to notice, not only was David a man that was, a man that was in trouble, not only was David a man that was terrified, but David was also a man that shed tears. David was also a man that shed tears. Fear will, fear will cause you to make decisions that you ought not to make. Fear will cause you to make foolish decisions. Fear will cause you to make faithless decisions. Fear will cause you to make decisions that have devastating consequences in your life. But here David was a man that shed tears. In Psalms chapter number 6, verse number 6, David speaking, he says this, I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears. David was a man that shed tears. He was in trouble, he was terrified, and he shed tears. But I can only imagine as he is writing, uh, which he will be writing in a moment, the book of in Psalms, we're going to look at it, which David wrote. But I can only imagine as he's sitting in this cave of Adullam, he, gets, he leaves Achish, the king of Gath, in chapter 21. And in chapter 22, verse number 1, he goes to 
Adullam and to this cave. And I can only imagine as he sits down in this cave and, and he's taking in all this, uh, everything that's going on in his life and he realizes his country is against him and the king is against him and, and everybody seems to be against him. And he realizes that he's made some bad decisions simply based on fear, and based on the circumstances of his life. And, and I'm sure as he's sitting there, it would not surprise me if David doesn't shed a few tears saying, God, why have you put me in this place? God, why have you allowed this into my life? God, I don't, I don't think I deserve this, God. Why have, you, why have you let me experience these things? I didn't deserve this, God. He expresses all of these things here in chapter 21 and chapter number 22. But here, David is a man that shed tears. Jeremiah cried in Jeremiah 9, 1. It says, Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears. Hezekiah cried unto the Lord in 2 Kings 20. Job cried unto the Lord in Job 16 and verse number 20. We find that these men of God shed tears time and time again. But I can imagine here David is. All of this is going on. But he writes a psalm that I want to look at. Psalms chapter 56. Psalms chapter 56. If you would turn there with me. Psalms chapter 56 this evening. We're going to look at verse number 1 down to verse number 9. Verse number 1 of Psalm 56 says, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. We find that David was a man that's in trouble. He tells us here in verse number 1, verse number 2. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Verse 2, my enemies would daily swallow me up. David was a man that was in trouble. But not only that, David was a man that was terrified. Look at verse 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? David was a man that shed tears. Here in Psalm chapter 50, 56, we find the three points that I've already given you. Died. He was in trouble, he was terrified, and he, was, he, he had shed tears. And here David is going through all of these things. And it would seem everybody and everything is against him. Nobody is for him. I mean, the, I can imagine the depression and the anxiety that is beginning to boil up in his heart and in his mind and thinking, what is even the point of living anymore when everybody's against me? And here David is, and he gets to the cave of Adullam in chapter number 22 of 1 Samuel, and he pins the words that you and I just read. And he willingly expresses that everybody was against him. He fighting daily oppresseth me. What time I am afraid. And, daily, and David begins to pour out his heart saying, everybody's against me. Nobody's for me. I'm terrified. I'm here. I'm weeping and I'm crying. Can you even imagine? Can you put yourself in David's shoes? And to be honest tonight, there's potentially you may, you may be in a situation like David was in, in the aspect of you may be in trouble. You may, you may be in a health situation. You may be in a financial situation. You may have a family situation. I have no idea. But the, the, the reality is you don't have to go very far to find somebody who's hurting. You know that? You don't have to go very far to find somebody who's hurting. We could walk out these doors and probably knock on just a handful of the neighbor's doors from this church and find somebody who, if they were honest, is hurting for one reason or another. And David said, I'm hurting. He said, I'm, I've went through all of these things. I'm in trouble. I'm terrified. I'm in tears. And that may be you tonight. You may be terrified for some reason or another. And the reality of it is, you potentially might have even cried yourself to sleep last night. The potential, the potential is there. I mean, I mean, it's a reality that, that there could be a situation in your life similar to David's. And you said, I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know if I can go through this. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't know if I want to keep fighting anymore like David was saying. And you may have cried yourself to sleep last night saying, I'm sick of this. I'm tired of this. I don't want to do this anymore. And the anxiety and the depression begins to well up in your heart. It begins to well up in your mind. But I'm thankful that David didn't stop writing in verse number 8. 
Look at verse number 9. It says, When I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. For God is for me. I'm thankful that as David is going through all of these things, as he's sitting in the cave of Adullam, and there he is and he's in trouble and he's terrified and he's, I can see him weeping as he's sitting there in the middle of this cave and he begins to pin the psalm that you and I just read and he begins to, to write these things down. My enemies daily are fighting me and what time I'm afraid. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. And he's writing all of these things down. I'm thankful that he did not stop at verse number 8. I'm thankful that he continued to write it and he said, you know what, even though everybody's against me, the circumstances are against me, I'm thankful that there's a God in heaven who is still for me. And tonight, if that doesn't bless your soul, I don't know what's going to because God God is still for you and He is still for me. God, you think about that? God is for me. He just, I don't know why, but He is. God is never for sin, but I'm thankful that God is for sinners. I'm thankful that when He gave His life and He died on the cross of Calvary, you know what He had on His mind? Me. But oh, how unworthy I am. Oh, how unworthy I am for him to have been thinking about me and for me to have been on his mind as he's giving his life on the cross. He had me on his mind. Why? Because he was for me then and he is for me now. Tonight, I don't, I don't know what you're going through tonight. I, I, I really don't. But I know this. You know, I said it a while ago. I'll say it again. You don't have to go very far to find somebody that's hurting. And in a congregation this size, with an auditorium that this full, there's somebody that's probably here tonight who's got a burden on their heart. It's weighing on their mind. They're in trouble of some kind. They're, they're, they're a little bit nervous about a situation. They're a little bit terrified. And you may even have shed some tears saying, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how we're going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. But can I just encourage you? Can I give you, can I give you a ray of hope tonight? God is for you. We were in we were out in Kansas in um sometime. When we were in Kansas, March, I think it was March of this year, uh at a meeting and a preacher got up and preached a message and to be honest I have no idea what he preached about. But somewhere along the message, in the message he said, I want you when you get time to turn over to Psalm chapter fifty six and look at verse number 9. Well, I was going to do it right that moment. And so I flipped over there, Psalm 56, 9, and I began to read. And I got to that very last phrase where it says, For God is for me. And that's the verse that I need because at that particular time in my life, there was a situation that was going on in my life and in our life, and I needed to, to be reminded that God was still for me, and God was still with me, and even if everybody else was against me, even if, you name it, if the government, the world was against me, I'm thankful that God was still for me, and I simply need to be reminded of that. So I know this, that if in my life if I needed that reminder, then the chances of you needing the reminder is probably pretty good. That God is still for you. David was a man that was in trouble. David was a man that was terrified. David was a man that shed tears. But at the end of the day, through all that was going on and all that was overtaking his life and all that he was going through, he realized and he remembered that there was still a God in heaven who loved him and was for him. And he begins to say in Psalm 56, 9, When I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. This I know. He didn't say this I hope, this I pray, uh, this, this I cross my fingers. No, 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 no. He said this I know. There was no question in David's mind. He said, for God is for me. And I'm thankful that God is for you tonight. I'm thankful that God is for me tonight. No matter what circumstances you're going through, you can always claim Psalm 56 9 and say, God, even in the midst of this trouble, even in the midst of this trial, even in the midst of all this, God, you're for me. And you can claim that and you can hold on to that even in the midst of everything that's going on. I'll tell you one more story and I'm done tonight. 
when I was uh, in between my seventh and my eighth grade in, in, in school. It was kind of a rough time in my family's life. My granny uh, was in the hospital and she was not doing well. She almost passed away about three or four different times and, and she was just not doing well at all. And, um, and so my mom was teaching in our Christian school at that time and she was driving to Little Rock on the weekends to be with my granny and just try to spend time with her and we didn't know if she was going to live and so that put me and my two brothers at home with dad trying to survive uh, on our own and I mean our family was spread thin and and there was just a whole a whole host of things that were going on in our lives on top of all of that and 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 there came a day it was a summer summer after my 7th grade school year and so I mean it was fresh out of summer and and the summer had kind of come and it had went and we were getting close to the next year probably sometime in July uh, late July and there is just one of those days that if something was going to go wrong it went wrong ever been there I mean if something was possibly going to go wrong that day it went wrong and so everything just kind of came to a head and I thought you know what this is ridiculous this is this is this is pathetic and I, I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of it. And so I went up to my room and I sat down in my bed and I just began to weep, began to cry. And said, God, you, I, God, I need a promise from you. God, I need a word from you. God, I need a truth from you. God, I, I, need, I need something from you right now. Ever been there? Ever just needed something from God? And so here's David, or here's, here I am, not David, here I am, sitting on my bed just weeping and crying and saying, God, I, I just need to hear from you. And so I thought, you know what, uh, when I come home from, from school, back in the school year was over, I took all my school books and I put them in this particular drawer in my dresser. I thought, I'll never see them again, praise the Lord. <laughs> but, so I thought, you know what, I have nothing better to do. I'm just going to clean out this drawer. And so I go over and I open up the drawer and I begin to pull out the algebra book and a chemistry book and a science book and a history book. And I get down to the very bottom of this drawer and there's a piece of paper that's folded up about two or three times and it's laying in the bottom of this drawer. I thought, well, that doesn't look like anything from school. I wonder what that is. And so I picked it up and, and uh, opened it up. And as I opened up that, that uh, piece of paper, it had two words on it. It said, it's okay. That's all it said. It's okay. And to this day, I said, out of the piece of paper, but to this day, I have no idea who wrote that on the piece of paper. To this day, I have no idea how that piece of paper got in my dresser drawer at my house, how long it had been there, but I do know this. I know that for that particular moment, at that particular time, I said, God, I need to hear from you. I need a word from you. I need a promise from you. I need to know that you're still for me. And God said, I can do that. And he gave me a piece of paper, folded up two or three times, and said, it's okay. And at that moment in my life, that's what I needed. I don't know if, I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know if God put that piece of paper there. I don't know if somebody from school had slipped that in one of my books and it fell out. I don't know if the person that I bought the dresser from put that piece of paper in there. I have no idea. But I do know this. At that moment in my life, I needed a reminder that God was to form me because of the circumstances that were boiling around me. Tonight, I don't know where you are. I don't know the circumstances in your life, but I do know this. God is for you. And because God is for you, everything is going to be okay. So, Brother Hagin, how's it going to work out? I have no idea. But so Brother Hagin, that, are you telling me that life is going to be a bed of roses and it's going to be perfect? Probably not. <laughs> but you know what? God's for me. And I, I'll say this and I'm done. If I'm going to have to struggle and I'm going to have to go through trials and I'm going to have to just go through things in my life, I would rather go through all of those things as a Christian relying on Jesus than to go through all of the exact same things, maybe even worse, as a lost person who has nobody to turn to. And I'm thankful that there's a God in heaven who is for me. And sometimes I just need to be reminded of that. Sometimes I just need to be reminded that God's still for me, God still loves me, and He's my biggest cheerleader. And He's up in heaven, and maybe He'll not be doing it like this, but He's saying, Go, Hagen, go, Hagen, go, Hagen. You can do it, Hagen. One more step, Hagen. One more step. You just need to take one more step of faith. Just trust me, Hagen. 
And I can picture God up in heaven being my biggest cheerleader. I'm for you. I'm for you. I'm for you. Come on, keep on. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't turn back. Come on. Tonight, I believe God's doing that for you too. God is for me. I don't know where you're at tonight, but maybe you just need to claim that verse. So I'm thankful that God's for me. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this privilege to get to preach tonight. Lord, I pray this was a help and a blessing and encouragement. God, I don't know where these folks are. God, I've only got to spend the day with them. But Lord, I'm thankful that you know them. And Lord, I'm thankful that you uh, know the ins and outs of their lives. God, you know their troubles. You know, uh, you know their trials. God, you know, you know if somebody cried themselves to sleep last night. God, you know. But God, I'm praying that you help this message to be a blessing and encouragement. God, that you would just remind them that in the midst of everything that's going on, you're still for them, you still love them, you're still supporting them, you're still their biggest cheerleader. Lord, I pray that you bless the invitation to come, bless the church. In Christ's name, amen.